Welcome to Conversations with uh, Professor Jack Dunitz, part of the Jack's uh, series uh, that we've been having over the last few uh, weeks. Um, Professor Dunitz is my colleague, retired here at the Eta Zurich, recently turned 98, and um, has lived through what some have called the golden era of chemistry, the, the previous century. And so um, I'd like to start off by asking you a question. You know, of all the developments, the discoveries, uh, the observations that have been made in the chemical sciences uh, through your lifetime, uh, what do you consider to be the most uh, significant or important or groundbreaking? Well, there are, for one thing, there's no question that the development of computers have completely altered chemistry. And this has not been due to one person. It's been due to the scientific com community. But the way people do science today has compared with the way that we did science, say, in 1950, is completely changed. Because at a button's age, you, are, you can connect with the history of the world, as it were. So that's a big change that has happened, uh, not just in chemistry, but in science and in life, too. As far as chemistry is concerned, one or two things have obviously developed enormously in the last half century or so. One of them is the intrusion of of quantum of calculations, both uh, calculations at a fundamental level, let's see what do we know about the hydrogen molecule, up to what do we know about some protein or virus. And this, the role of not observing but doing some calculation has enormously changed in the last since I started off. That's two things. So thirdly, now I'm coming to a more personal level, what has enormously changed also is organometallic chemistry, because organometallic chemistry started about in the early 50s when Peter Pawson made ferrocene. And uh, at that time, it was that was an enormous. It wasn't just; it was a surprise to everybody. You showed me some correspondence you had with R. B. Woodward on uh, Ferris. With Woodward, yes, because he he I first learned about ferrocene through his first paper with us, several co-authors in Jacks. Yeah. yes, and I read this paper in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, and I thought, what a nerve this guy's got. Out of no evidence at all, he's drawing all these, all these fancy conclusions. And I, uh, was, and I was going out of the Bodleian Library, I met Le Leslie Orgel, and I told him I've just read this paper, and why don't, uh, let's go and look at it again. And he also agreed that this was a piece of bravado. But then we noticed that we asked, we went to a friendly organic chemist in Robinson's lab and I said, we said, look, uh, is this difficult to make? He said, no, no, I can make it for tomorrow. <laughs> so he, he made it and I went and did, uh, within, I would say, two weeks from getting the crystals, I had the crystal structure. And Woodward, Woodward was, Woodward's model was perfectly correct. But the way he described theoretically, he, it was very, in my opinion, very primitive because he wanted the rings to be aromatic, and we wanted them to be neutral. Now, in those days, you needed six electrons 
to be. Sure. And yeah. in the first paper he wrote, they had forgotten about this. So Leslie... You had forgotten about that. <laughs> That's curious. <laughs> well, in the same paper, he has right. these two. It's aromatic and it's neutral. You can... So Leslie and I, I told Leslie came back three or four days later and said he is now, he sees how to do it theoretically. And so we published a paper. We sent our paper into Nature, I think, at the beginning of August, and it was published the following January. Whereas when he, That's Woodward, actually pretty fast, huh? <laughs> when Woodward sent a paper in on the 4th of February, it was published on the 20th of February. <laughs> so he was, as it were, he had already headed, but the, I think this was, I, I realized, we realized that this was the beginning of, uh, and I remember Leslie, Leslie, I hindered him from become making a very good prediction because he, from his model, he said that it's not just iron who can go in, you can put Others. in other metals. And in particular, nickel, is nickel compound is going to be in very interesting from a theoretic. Right. And I said, Leslie, look, we've got some nice facts. It's solid. And now, do we really want to put in so much speculation? In that? <laughs> so I, dis I co persuaded him that we should write the paper without the extension to other but, but I thought you also had a correction as to how it was illustrated. Or is that in the cover of Pauling's book? Well, there was a, there was the wrong symmetry. I thought you had... Well, but that was everybody. You see, from the crystallography, the molecule had a center of symmetry. Yeah. And everybody wrote the two rings as being staggered, not eclipsed, staggered. But I, in our second paper on ferrocene, we realized that the crystal structure at room temperature is disordered. And what we are looking at is an averaged structure. Right. And not the, and so we only said it looks like an, you shouldn't believe it too much. But then when I was here 20 years later with Paul Seiler, Paul Seiler uh, did, the, with the structure at room temperature, he did the structure at about minus 150, and he knew there was a phase transition below that. And by very clever maneuvering, he prepared, he crystallized ferrocene at about plus 80 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm from making a liquid, I mean, what is a liquid then? You need a liquid to crystallize. And he succeeded in doing that. And we established that the thermodynamically stable structure of ferrocene is eclipsed and not staggered. So right. everybody had been wrong all these years. And it still is. And I think in 1992, that would have been the 40th anniversary. I think I wrote somewhere a kind of review of 40 years of ferrocene. But uh, anyway, that was certainly a big uh, thing. And the other thing, of course, which has, which uh, is that I was, uh, I was present at the unveiling of the DNA structure. Yes, yeah, so you went, told me about that. I had discussed, I discussed DNA with Francis Crick and Jim Watson over for the two or three years preceding that, and it, and to actually see the real structure with the correct uh, hel helicity. This was a fantastic. I mean, I knew. Now I'm looking here at a discovery which is going to change science. To know you knew you were at the right. To know the structure 
of the of the hereditary molecule. So we thought, because at that time it took another decade or so to for scientists to come to the conclusion that it's RNA, which is the <laughs> original designer molecule, and DNA is a product, as it were, of RNA chemistry. But this only happened during the following decade. Although I seem to recall you telling me, and we could go into politics briefly, that Pauling would have seen it if had he been allowed to attend a conference uh, uh, one summer. But he, of course, he wasn't allowed because of the Red Scare that was taking place um, in no, the U.S. at the time. So he wasn't issued a passport or something. What I what I alleged that if he had come to London, yeah. and if he had visited King's College. And if he had seen the X-ray photographs of Rosalind Franklin, he would have known. Then he would have, he would have seen it because. Uh, but all these ifs, and in fact, he, the U.S. didn't give him a visa, so yeah, that's, he didn't yeah. come at all. He came only, he came only a year or so later, and it was immediate. Although he had his own wrong structure. The DNA, sure. which contained, for some reason, three, three chains. I have no idea why. Uh, I remember that. Although, in some respects, he was ahead of his time, given triple helical DNA, right? Yeah, but Werner Shoemaker said, Werner Shoemaker, I'm told, when Pauling gave his talk, said, Linus, this is impossible. <laughs> if this were the structure of our of DNA, it would explode. It would explode, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But you also, uh, with Pauling, uh, have told me that um, initially, to, referring to protein structure, he had talked about spirals. No. And you pointed no. out to him that it's probably better to refer to them as helices. No, let me correct that slightly. He, he and other authors had talked about these structures as spirals. Now, he gave his first lecture at Caltech itself, an internal lecture, where he very dramatically unveiled his structure, and he called it a spiral structure. And in the first publication with him and Corey, it's called a spiral structure. And I met him one day in the corridor, and he said, well, Jack, what did you think about our about this model, and I said, I'm, I was flat. I think it's terrific, wonderful, what uh, you, how you've seen this. But I said, I have only one question. You call it a spiral, and isn't it more correct? Isn't for me a spiral is a planar uh, diagram, two dimensional. and if it's three dimensional, it's a helix. He said, Jack, you're completely wrong. <laughs> the two words are entirely synonymous. The two words are synonymous, but I have to say, I like spy. <laughs> I like helix better. <laughs> and thereafter, he probably only used helix, right? Yes, and he liked that because it distinguished his structure from all the everybody else had talked about spirals, and his structure would just have been another spiral. Aha. Uh -huh. That's my way of looking at it. But in the second, in the first paper he wrote with Corey, it's called a spiral, and in the PNES paper, it's called the helix. And I believe I I contributed to that. <laughs> That's an important point to make historically, right? Uh, we we'd be calling it a spiral um, to this day. Yes. Well, it is no doubt. Uh, uh, it wouldn't have changed the history of science, except helix as such. The DNA is certainly a DNA helix. And by that time, but by three years later, everybody was talking about helices. But there's a paper, I think, in the 60s or 70s, to say that, she Pauling had talked about NH2, NH2, but doubly charged. The cation. Yeah, the, the double cation. Okay. He had argued 
that the two positive charges repel each other and that the bond distance increases. But uh, I, he hadn't read the lip for once. I knew, <laughs> I knew from not very good X-ray pictures that the, di the doubly charged molecule, the N-N distance, was slightly smaller and not bigger. And there was a there was a theoretical calculator had come to work with Gunther called Ha. Do you remember Ha? Was no. he there? Okay. Well, I told him about this and said, it's just after all, I said, uh, let's take a simple model and take the hydrogen molecule and see what the distance is as you change the charge of the pro of the plus and leave the electric the electron charge the same. And we found that when you make the positive charge a little bigger than one and keep the negative charge the same, there is a slight contraction to about 20%. And then the plus plus starts to right. starts to work. But for a small uh, for for put charges up to about about 0.1 or 0.2, there was no question that the molecule contracts against expectation and so forth. The reason is, of course, that when you make the positive charge bigger, you also pull electrons into the sure. into the middle, and so uh, we we published this paper. And that was one of the few occasions where I essentially said the idea of calling was uh, oh, blasphemy there. Huh? <laughs> that was incorrect. Yeah. <laughs>